Welcome to chapter 11, the first of three chapters dedicated to talking about promotion. Now the important thing to understand about promotion is that it is a significant high visibility but very vulnerable element of marketing. A lot of people who haven't had it grounded in marketing think advertising is marketing and the two are interchangeable. This is not the case. Now, although we have three chapters dedicated to it, the reason why advertising is quite so vulnerable is it relies on the existence of the product. It's heavily dependent on segmentation. It is critically dependent on targeting, and it is the reason we have positioning is that we use communications to create positioning. So without the fundamentals under the hood, advertising fails. So despite the fact that there are three chapters for this, it is, I usually teach it as the, one of the last parts of the marketing mix, because you need to have your product together. You need to know what it is you're offering, who you're offering it to, and you need to have that value offer fixed in terms of pricing, strategy, positioning, and then you come out with your communications to reinforce and support that. So what we're going to deal with with the promotion slides is this is going to be the highlights package of a highlights package. Advertising is taught as a full length semester and advertising is a major visible area of research. It's also one of these areas where there are actually universities that offer full majors in advertising communication. And there are, there's a fairly big career to be had if you go into this field. But it's also a field that's cross-dependent. So if you're good at market research, you can become a real asset to an advertising agency because you can do the market testing of the advert. You can see what was successful and what failed. We're now at the fourth part of the book, which is the communication the value proposition. So here, what we are dependent on is that the organization understands who they're addressing and what the offer is that they're about to make to that audience. And now the communication is that you try to make that offer in a way that will be appreciated by the audience and the audience will respond to. So what we're going to talk about in this combination of chapters is the concept of the integrated marketing communication. Now IMC is actually an ideology. Uh, as well as being definition, it's this idea of centralized control. It is actually possibly responsible for this whole idea of being on message and off message, is that you want to have a single cohesive voice. IMC clashes with real-time marketing, social media, but it can also work in with social media insofar as the integration is the key part. So as long as you are consistent with the message, that is what we're looking for. So what does IMC do? It's basically about persuasion. Why us? So we're really emphasizing here the communication to create the perception of relative advantage. It's about the reminder. So here we're looking at the message to the existing customer, the retention of loyalty or the consumption of existing of an existing product. So persuade is new product or existing product to new market. Remind is existing product to existing market. It plays a role of assisting the other elements of the marketing mix. If we are positioning ourselves as a high quality product, the advertising should communicate in a similar manner. Distribution can be reinforced through advertising that lets people know where to access a product. Advertising can be used to support price. It can be used to communicate changes in price. But also, if we are setting a price that is a psychological price, where we're looking at luxury, where we're looking at prestige, our messages can communicate that. We can also communicate the social prices of time. We can show that this is quick or that this is long, this is slow. We can show the other type of user in fact, one of the things that IMC can do is it can show you the target market 
that you desire can be shown in the advert so the target market can see themselves reflected and represented on the screen. You can also show aspirational target markets. The idea that if you use this product you will be able to climb social class. So you tie that back to your consumer behavior. It can build relationships with customers. You can build loyalty. You can also lose loyalty. Uh, if your ads are offensive or your ads, you decide to go in a new direction with your ad campaign, which is uh, basically not consistent with the values of your market, you can break relationships. However, if your ads are consistent and you don't embarrass your market, you can build the relationships through communication. You have both mass market communication and personal communication to build relationships with. And finally, you have the information aspect. You can display the product in use in an advert. And this is one of the things about IMC is that you can actually teach people how to use your product. You can, from the point of view of services, you can display the service in action. From the point of view of physical goods, you can show the goods in context, in use, in consumption. So you actually have an information and educational role you can play with your communications to assist the consumer in understanding how to unlock the best value out of their product. In fact, one of the ads that does this better than anyone else was the original ad that I, Apple put out for the iPod Touch showed dozens of different uses for it and showed how if you turned the device, the screen would respond. It was an education campaign. It was, it's, we know you're not going to read the manual, so here's the 30 second summary of the manual. Swing the device around, stuff will happen. So, in terms of this chapter, this is one of, there are several important theoretical models. Again, for you, this is an overview. When you go on to do the advertising subject, you get to work with these models in depth. But this one I want to quickly bring to your attention because the communications model directly impacts on you because you are going to be communicating to me. Now at this point you've, probably, you've done a series of assessment tasks. So you have been the source. You have encoded your knowledge. The message, message of your answer to the question on the medium of an assignment I have read it, decoded it as the receiver, and the purchase and the feedback has been whether I've scored the points you've scored for it and actual words I've said on your page. But if you look at this model, and I want you to read this model in the textbook, and I want you to look at the encoding and the decoding, because this is where it gets really interesting for you as a communicator. It's the encoding, the translating of an idea into a form that will convey meaning. When you are writing this assignment, and you're, when you're writing assignments for anyone, this is why I ask for that creativity and your own personal touch, is because I'm asking you to practice encoding. I'm also asking you to use signaling in here so that when I decode this, I can see what was yours and what was inspired by others. And the coding there is to use, you encode that this material was inspired by others by using reference. The message is the communication that come the assignment that I receive. And in this, what we also encounter is the concept of noise. So where you don't write, where the idea doesn't come out of your head. And specifically in here, and the encoding where you know what you meant to say, but it wasn't the message I received. So encoding to decoding is a critical factor here. So look at this part, and again, look at it from two perspectives. One, what can I learn as a marketer? And two, as a person who has written communication and verbal communication as assessment tasks, what can I learn as a student? How can I improve my encoding? How can I possibly even improve my decoding? Okay, just to complicate things, the marketing mix was four component parts. Price, product, place, promotion. Within promotion, we have the promotion mix. Advertising, interactive marketing, sales promotion, 
personal selling, direct marketing, public relations. Publicity occasionally gets a run here, but publicity and public relations seem to have come together as a single unit and been possibly publicity got bumped by interactive. Interactive also takes out, uh, is a newcomer insofar as uh, we've only really had access to the commercialized internet since the 90s. So whilst that's two decades, it's a lot less time than we've had television, less time than we've had radio, and significantly less time than we've had public relations and direct marketing. And personal selling, that just goes back to the beginning. So we've got techniques here. We also like to point out that advertising is considerably old and sales promotion and personal selling is even older. What I'm going to ask you to do though with the promotion mix is to be mindful that the promotion mix is a subset of a subset. It's one part, it's the component parts of promotion inside the whole of the marketing mix. It doesn't replace the whole marketing mix. You also want to be looking at these again as this, the toolkit of what's on the shelf that I can make use of. I'm going to briefly, as I'm talking through this chapter, because you've got three chapters to cover um, in related areas, I'm not going to go into depth on each of the component parts. I'm going to flag key models and key theoretical areas I think are important. So briefly, advertising is the one that you're most commonly aware of. It's the non-personal communication. So it's your mass media, it has an identified sponsor, it's big, it's visible, and it's the magician's other hand. If we look at this from the point of view of, if you're watching this hand, you're not aware of where the other hand is and what it's doing. So advertising gets your attention and helps with the awareness. We go back to the consumer decision models. It can help raise awareness of a problem that needs solving or a solution to an existing problem. But advertising is dependent on the solution. Advertising is dependent on the product being valuable and the price being right and the distribution being effective. Advertising doesn't work on its own. You can't advertise your way out of a marketing problem. Within advertising, there are a couple of critical uh, theoretical areas you want to look at. The hierarchy of effects model, again, when we talk about this as a model, we're talking about it as a way of thinking and seeing the world. There's been criticisms of the fact that you can't mathematically test this model, but you wouldn't want to. It's not its purpose. So the hierarchy of effects model, what it does is that the principle is we can do a sequence of ideas. We can create awareness, we can inform a market, we can create desire, we can encourage trial, we can build loyalty. But each of these steps represents a specific task. If we think about this again from segmentation, we now have the opportunity to segment around the hierarchy of effects of who is our target audience. Well, we want a new, we have a product that exists and we're taking it to a new market. Does this market know about our product? If they don't, then we have a segment of the, un the under-informed, under-informed potential adopter. We need to create awareness in that market. That's our hierarchy of effects, but it's also a segment. We have a market that knows we exist, but doesn't know what we do. That's our information. We have a market that's aware of us, knows what's going on. We now need to motivate them. So the interested but uncommitted, we want to create desire. The interested but untested, encourage trial. The tried it, liked it, considering it, build loyalty. All of these elements are objectives that you can work with. These are segments you can develop. You can use the hierarchy of effects model as a segmentation basis that will then give you your targeting and your positioning plan. So with a model like this, again, it's about seeing the world. It's about using a series of preset approaches to think through to make certain you're covering your bases and then adapting and applying it. In terms of communication, we have a push strategy and a pull strategy. I will say now, this is always a difficult one because I frequently flip these around in my head. 
The push strategy is where you target your communications to channel members. So go back to your business to business model and you are trying to push the product into the market. This is where the markets you, by the way, push and pull are not mutually exclusive. You don't have to run one or the other. You have a spectrum. A pull strategy is where you talk about the, you go and talk to the end consumer and you try and create demand. So a pull strategy is where you have people asking, do you stock? Do you have? And the retailer is going to go and try and seek out your product to stock it because they keep getting questions about it. The push strategy is where you are going to ensure that the, the consumer can walk straight into the store and get. Now push strategy has a risk that uh, because you're focusing on the business to business partner that the consumer, you might get perfect distribution, you might get everyone uh, stocking your goods but you've got no demand for it because no one, you didn't have any consumer interest. The flip side is on the pull strategy is that you might create massive demand but because you don't have the distribution all you've done is opened up a market where a customer walks into a store asks do you have the product? The store doesn't because your pull strategy hasn't been supported with a push strategy. The channels aren't open. There is demand. That demand will be satisfied by a competitor's product. So they're not ex they're extremes of a spectrum. You would want to use both. But you would be wanting to think which market should my push strategy aim for? Which market should my pull strategy aim for? And again, segmentation, this would be a technique to go to specific markets. All right, the advertising appeals, I want to briefly talk about this. Positioning, 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 positioning. The unique selling proposition is a positioning statement. It's the central idea of the ad, but it also underpins, here is my target audience, what will appeal to them? There's a bunch of different techniques on the screen in front of you. I just want to say now that the sex appeal is basically overrated and pretty much useless. There is the mantra that sex sells. And it doesn't. This is the worst part, is that we keep going shouting, sex sells, but it doesn't. What sells is value. And because if sex did sell, we would sell coal. We would sell environment change. We would sell politicians on that front and we don't and we they don't sell that way the notion that sex sells came about basically because we were testing hypothesis without completely testing hypothesis we would say oh look, we'll put a we'll discount the price of this product and we'll put a semi naked person on the advertising, oh look, it sold more products, it's got to be the naked person. We ignored the impact of price. We ignored the impact of other factors because we were only testing for one variable. When we did the same thing, but we put a picture of a kitten on there, and we put a picture of a rock on there, and we put a picture of a bunch of dead flowers, pretty much if you drop the price low enough, dead flowers sell. So basically, be careful. Some of the advertising appeals messages as well are old theory. They've come from testing 1970s white male middle class MBA students where 55 of them in a room were deemed to be a representation of the globe, of everyone's opinion across the world. So watch for it, be careful on it. And also from a social marketer, as a person who actually deals with social change, one of the campaigns that was run in Singapore in the mid-90s was they actually had to have a campaign to sell sex. People weren't having children, so the government had to come up with a campaign to encourage procreation. And if you ever want to talk about an embarrassing moment for the sex appeal lobby, is that they didn't use sex appeal to sell sex. They sold sex with cars. The advertising promised cars to people who had children. Now, if there is a perfect place for sex sales to work, selling sex, it didn't, it doesn't, leave it out. It's an area that's most likely to be used as 
a soft option to get your ad banned so you can have a soft option controversy again soft options necessarily are bad options so be careful look around this look at what actually your audience wants to hear not necessarily what you or your advertising agency wants to tell all right another model of importance the IATA model attention interest design action a uh, big chunk of this has been used in the design of this course, particularly around the assessment tasks. Get your attention, run you a short video, hold your interest, tell you about important things about the assessment task, create desire, go off and do this, produce action, hopefully you write an assignment. From a marketer's perspective, attention, interest, desire, action, again, these can be points in the segmentation schedule. You need to get attention, you need to get people to know you exist, you need to get them to stay interested and not turned off. So there is this thing, the idea of any publicity is good publicity. No, any publicity is attention. Good publicity keeps interest. Bad publicity turns your interest off. So people hear about you and go, yeah, you are a person I want nothing to do with. You are a brand I want to avoid. If you got their attention, maybe you got their interest. You sure as heck didn't create the desire you want. And that's the other thing to be aware of here is that attention, interest, desire, you can create negative desire. And that negative desire can produce negative action. So if you write an, an offensive advert to get attention, to shock the market, show that you're out there and you know, outrageous, oh, you'll get interest, all right. And that desire will be a boycott. And that action will be you lose market share. So be smart about it. All right, advertising is an area where you can absolutely destroy the hard work of the rest of the marketing mix by being stupid based on old cliches. All right, media selection. I want to just flag this to you. Uh, there's a chunk of this chapter that's going to talk about the different media channels. One of the things that makes advertising so complicated and why it's a great course to do is that you're one part of the marketing mix. And then within that part of the marketing mix, you've got the promotion mix. Within that part of the promotion mix, inside advertising, you've got the media channels. So you've got this massive branch chain diagram of choices you can make. Again, what you are looking for here is if you think back to your target market profile. Part of your target market profile was the selection of media channels. What media channels did the audience use? If you know that, then you know where to reach them. You know how to address them. If you can't tell me, and when you say television, I want to know what show and what time. That's the sort of segmentation you want to know as well. Radio, it's not just, oh, they listen to the radio. Yeah, what station? What newspaper do they read? Which bit of the newspaper do they read? What are the magazines they read? Which part of the magazine do you want to be advertising in? So you want to be really, you want your segmentation and your targeting to really help here because, and this is why I really emphasize you want detail in those target market profiles so you can select the right part of the media. And the other part of this is that if you select the right part of the media and you do it well, you're creating value for that media. So if you're advertising on TV, in a TV show, and your audience likes your product, they like the show and you're making a good connection here, you're going to keep that show going. It's going to be financially viable for you to continue advertising. You're supporting your audience through sponsoring the show. They're supporting you through buying your product. It's a good match. And ethically, we're doing the right thing. We are providing benefit to multiple parties. So you've got to know your audience. All right. The near the last things that we want to talk about briefly is I want to mention the evaluation, advertising, IMC comes with objectives. Objectives come with measures and metrics. In the evaluation, you are using market research. You, as I said at the top, if you're good at market research and you want to work for an advertising agency, you're going to be their best friend because if you can do recall tests, aided recall and unaided recall, and there are some amazing things that have been done in advertising testing copy testing. So if you've got market research skills and you want to be in advertising, this is a great place, a great way to make yourself a good career and useful. Because a lot of evaluation is going to be required to 
uh, understand is the advert having the impact we desire with the audience we want. So evaluation is a really important area and again drawing on your market research skills both qualitative and quantitative. So the last highlights here is just want to briefly mention the public relations. Uh, PR is an interesting facet to marketing because it's probably the point where we've got the most criticisms and the most, eth most ethical problems. With PR, when you look at the list of things that are on the PR activity list, when we're doing lobbying, when we're corporate identity, special events, guerrilla marketing, look, look over this, but be mindful that public relations is the part that most consumers feel is dishonest and manipulative. With advertising, we're blunt. We go out, we put a sponsored message up, we put our name to it and say, that's us, this is what we did. When we start trying to do subtle subterfuge media manipulations, when we're trying to run without having our identity for foremost and upfront, people get a little upset about that, and justifiably so. So be careful with your PR techniques and your PR strategies. They are one of the highest risk areas because you can run into a world of trouble of your audience feeling that you are trying to mislead them or manipulate them. All right, this is the first of three promotion chapters. So if you need me on any of the uh, platforms here or on the Twitter or across the email.